Well, this past week, I got to do two things that are always kind of fun. Wednesday, I went to watch the Rays. It was a good game for about seven innings. Actually, it was a really good game for about seven innings. Um, and I went to see Mission Impossible. And anyway, I'm a, I'm a bigger Chris Archer fan than I am Tom Cruise. Let's just put it that way. Uh, anyway, when I went there, I thought, you know, part of going it is the experience of seeing the game or seeing the movie, but it's also, uh, you know, you can't go to a baseball game without having a hot dog and a Coke. <laughs> and you can't go to the movie without having and a Coke. Hmm. But we come to church and we don't give you anything. And I thought, well, I wonder how it would go if, if we, every Sunday, passed out banana bread. What do you think about that? Let's have some banana bread. Here you go, Fred, have a little banana bread. Bob, you look like you could use some. Have some banana bread. Here. Would you like some, Doc? Here, have some banana bread. There. Is this a little? We're... You want to eat it now, please. Eat it now. Here, have some. This is, this is a part of the show today. Eat it. Have some, yeah. Here you go. Have a little banana bread. Eat it up. And now I want to know if it's any good. Tell me, is it any good? I got some more. Here, you look hungry. How about Bev? Here you go. There's some for you. Dell, you look like you like banana bread. Have some. Here you go. And not to say you always forget us in the back. Here you go. There's some banana bread. Eat it up. Tell me, is it good? Do I get an amen? Was it good? If not, you're going to have to answer to somebody. Huh? Did you like it? Hmm. What do you think? Would attendance pick up if every week we serve fresh banana bread? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, it'd pick up, I think, for a while, and then knowing people and knowing my congregation, after about four weeks, people would say, well, it should have chocolate chips in it. <laughs> and after a while, then someone would say, well, it should be cranberry bread. It shouldn't be that. Or maybe we should go to cookies, oatmeal cookies, or perhaps rye bread. Rye bread, homemade rye bread with butter. I can smell it and taste it now. You see what I'm talking about? It's interesting because things always start out pretty good and they feed us and they make us feel well, uh, but then this human thing we have settles in. We become dissatisfied. We become anxious. We become concerned about ourselves. And all of a sudden, what has happened in that process? We no longer come to church for one thing. We begin to come for another. It shifts our focus. It changes what we are about. And I think in a way, this is what Jesus encountered when he multiplied the fish and the loaves. You know, he just finished doing this. It's pretty astounding, and it must have been pretty good fish and pretty good bread because the text says they ate their fill. Now, when I eat my fill, my fill I'm done. But they weren't ran around the lake to meet him because they wanted more. Why is it that they so quickly forgot the gift that they got and they wanted more? They weren't happy. They weren't satisfied. Because on the one hand, I, you know, on the one hand, there is within us that, that desire, there is that ability within us. We are always anxious. We are always dissatisfied. We are sometimes even on the verge of being greedy. There's a part of us that's always seeking, wanting, desiring more than we have. And, and to a degree, that's good because it is, it is that desire for more or better or to improve that creates and innovates and keeps us on our toes and keeps us moving. It helps us to explore and to discover and to uncover. But I would also tell you that same characteristic causes us dis-ease and unrest, dissatisfaction, restlessness, and a lack of peace. I am reminded of the words of St. Augustine who said, Our souls are restless till they find their rest in thee. Because what we miss, 
what we miss in all of this is that the blessings in our possession, the blessings we are given, they're not ends in and of themselves. They are conduits. They are vehicles. They are spectacles by which we see to a greater realm and to a greater way of life. To see the good behind them. To see what created them. The things we have and hold and eat and enjoy and, and absorb into our lives are really directional compasses that are trying to point us somewhere else to something more. To the God who made them. Oh, God may use the minds and the hands of people to create, but who gave people the minds and the hands and the abilities and the drive and the skills to do those things? Where did they come from? You see, and if we believe that the gifts and the skills to create and to heal and to help and to hold and to make and to bake, if we believe that those things somehow originate from the divine, then I want, what I'm telling you is everything in life, everything in life gives us insights. It's a window into our maker. That all of creation, when your theology says that it all emanates from the divine, then all of creation becomes an extension of the divine. An extension of the one who made it. Which means then that every moment of every day presents the very real opportunity for us to be nourished by the Spirit and the presence of God. Every minute, this very minute presents that opportunity. What do we sing week after week? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. This is what it means to live a prayerful life. You know, we have this image in our minds that to be a prayerful person or to live a prayerful life is to walk around like this with your head down and bowed and your hands folded all the time and hunched over and whipping yourself on the back or whatever it takes to, to always be in communication with God. When in reality, to live a prayerful life means that everything you see, every encounter you have, every relationship you build has the power and the ability to open windows and doors into the holy if we are created in the image of God, then every person you look at has the ability to make that gift to you. You see, this is what the psalmist, powerful words, the psalmist, Psalm 34, read it, put it on your refrigerator, memorize it, use it as a mantra. Psalm 34, he writes, I bless God with every chance I get and I live and breathe God and it frees me from my anxious fears and then he says taste and see that God is good isn't that interesting he doesn't say bow and pray taste and see that's as human and realistic as you can get taste and see you know, one of the simple things in, uh, sh certainly in church life, but in general in our cultural life as well, that we have uh, kind of let fall to the wayside, and I think it's had dramatic effects, uh, a sense of connectedness and investment in one another and the building of community. You know, when I grew up in, in the church uh, as a child, one of my favorite things to go to were potluck dinners. Anybody here? Do I get an amen into that? Anybody remember potluck dinners? Nobody makes potluck dinners anymore, do they? We go to Publix and we bring things. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because you still get together, but there is some symbolism in that. And let me go back just a step further. I also remember the bake sales. And I grew up in a German congregation where they made, where they made German noodle soup and butter balls. And if you've never had butter balls in your life, they are to die for. And, and, and they were wonderful to eat, but as a child, wandering around in the kitchen, I remember the older women of the church talking and sharing and crying and laughing. It wasn't about the food. It was about the relationships and the investments they were willing to make in one another. You see, it moved beyond people. It, re it moved beyond what created the people and brought the people together. 
You know, similarly, I think one of the things that's caused, uh, I think it's caused a lot of destruction in our family is that families don't eat together anymore. You know, we're all so busy, we look for what's convenient, what's fast, we eat in the car, we move, because other things are more important. The destination and where we're at it is more important than the time spent together. And when you get together, what do you do? Why do you complain about what mom made and mom makes you eat it anyway or, or whatever else you talk about the day? But you are investing you are investing in others. You are investing in the, in, the, in the base community of our society. You are teaching what it means to live together. You know, people are in the same room these days, but they're not really with each other. So we feed our bodies as quickly, as conveniently as possible. And then we wonder why we're disconnected. Because we aren't invested. We fill our stomachs, but leave a hole in our soul. That's why uh, when preaching works, and it doesn't always work. No, I, I mean that. It doesn't all, preaching doesn't always work. Uh, you know, I say if I preach two or three good sermons a year, I'm right on track. Because there is something that happens when people come together like this, and you all come from different backgrounds, different weeks, different needs, different expectations. you got nothing in common in that way, except you come here to meet the divine. That's it. And sometimes, sometimes you even hear God. You no longer see Keith up here, but you see through Keith, through Keith to what you're really seeking. And that's when it really happens. And we lose that, you see. We lose that when it becomes about the preacher or it becomes about the singer or it becomes about what I do when I play an instrument or sing a song. It's not about that. We are merely seeking to be conduits and a directional compass to the divine. I think even the church has lost that. You know, I think back on the astronauts. When the astronauts got into outer space and the first Apollo and they read Genesis and then they said, in looking at the earth, they touch the face of God. It wasn't about the earth, it was about all. Maybe that's why when Jesus began his ministry in the wilderness and he was tempted, the devil came and tempted him three times, he hit him right at his base knee. He said, turn this stone into bread. Turn the stone into bread. You can do it. You can do it on your head, superstar said. And Jesus says, huh, because human beings must live by more than that. But what emanates, and he says scripture, what emanates from the divine. I love the words of a poet who once said, a raindrop finds joy when it becomes part of a river. A raindrop finds joy when it becomes part of a river, something bigger, something flowing, something purposeful, something in the great cycle of life. You might not like that as much the last three weeks as you would have liked it a month ago. But there is blessings in all of it. You see, and our lives are changed when we begin to see our existence in this way. We become less possessive. We become less critical. We become less jealous of others and what they might produce. We become less self-absorbed because it's not about us. It's not about them. It's about are we bringing people to God? Are we a conduit to the divine? Is our purpose here achieving what it's supposed to achieve. How different things would be if we lived that way. So why don't we? And I'm in the same boat, man. I struggle the same way. These last three weeks have been rough. You know, when I went to Chicago, when we moved to Chicago in 92, from Denver, the sun didn't shine for 30 days. And I rolled over one morning in bed and I said to my wife, you know that there are babies born in this world that still don't know what the sun is? 
And the congregation was so concerned, they cut out a big paper sun and painted it orange and hung it on the balcony for me because they didn't want me to go back to Colorado. How many of you ate banana bread this morning? Raise your hands. If you had the banana bread, raise your hand. Behind the banana bread you ate this morning were all the people who grew the bananas, all the people who grew the elements that made that bread, the people who shipped it, the people who packed it, the people who put it in the store, the people who priced it, the people who bagged it, my family who brought it to the house, my wife who did her thing and lovingly made it. When you ate that, you weren't just eating bread. You were eating my home, my family, and all those people. You ingested it all. It is literally now a part of you. It's in you. So it is with the bread we break at another table. We should think about that. So it is the bread we break at this table. This table is Christ's table. Where when we come here, we should remind ourselves of how close Christ would want to be to us. So close that Christ says, when you eat this bread, think of where it came from. Think of the God who created the world. Think of the God who brings the sunshine and the rain that makes the wheat. Think of me. Remember me. Take me into you that we will be one. Desire, God desires to be that close to us. How that happens, don't ask me. I don't know. You know, I believe that when we take the elements, God is, Christ is with, in, with, and under the elements. What that means, I can't explain. But the question I ask is, um, are we, because God is more ready to connect to us than we are willing to connect to God. And we miss getting there when we lose ourselves in the notion of, well, it's just bread or it's just a cup, or it's just popcorn, (laughs) or whatever it is, it's not that. It is a vehicle, a tool to open our eyes and to get as intimate and close and invested as we can. Because for those who get that and understand that, there is power, there is wholeness, there is grace, there comes a fullness of the Spirit and an appreciation in our souls that is eternal. So I challenge you and encourage you today, when you leave, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God is good always. Amen.